This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Julian Baker, who is curator of medieval and modern coins and related objects at the Heberding Coin Room at the Ashmolean University or at Ashmolean Museum at the University of Oxford in, uh, in England. Um, Dr. Baker is a specialist in the economic history of the medieval Mediterranean, and in fact was a student of the famed John Halden when he was doing his PhD. Um, I'm not much of a specialist in uh, that period, but I did read a great deal of Halden's work when I was a student myself, uh, interested in later periods of the Mediterranean. Uh, Dr. Baker has published extensively. He's the author of well over 50 articles, chapters, as well as a rather large two-volume work on the coinage and money in medieval Greece from 1200 to 1430. Uh, in addition, he's been uh, spending a great deal of time working on various coin finds from around the Mediterranean, and today he will be talking to us about some of those finds in a presentation entitled New Medieval Coin Finds from the Area of Finike in Southern Albania. So, uh, Julian, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Okay, th thank you, Peter, and, and, and thank you for the invitation. And um, of course, thank you to you all for, for attending this, uh, this afternoon. So I'm gonna begin by setting out a few contexts so the, the modern Albanian state and the geographical and the medieval situation. So um, Albania is a rather small country in the Western Balkans, which was not a unit in, in this form in medieval times. The important things to bear in mind are, are the ra rather long coastline that you can see here as compared to the total land mass. And the two main uh, modern coastal cities were also the main medieval towns. So in the center, you have Dures, which is known as Dirachion in Greek and uh, Durazzo in Italian. And further to the south, you have Vlora, which is known as Avlon or Avlona in Greek and Valona in Italian. The country as a whole is, is very mountainous, uh, but there are important coastal plains. Um, they are around these two cities and there's a more minor one in the extreme south. So as, as we zoom out, more things become apparent. So first, the, the extreme closeness of the Italian peninsula uh, to the area of Vlora. So the, the so-called Straits of Otran to divide the Adriatic, which is in the north, uh, and the Ionian Sea in the south. And in this uh, southerly Ionian area, the Albanian coastline uh, um, is hemmed in uh, between the Greek uh, island of Corfu uh, in the west, and then to the east there are mountains, and, and, and beyond the mountains lie modern uh, mainland Greek territories uh, towards the city of Janina. The, the modern Albanian capital of Tirana had been a rather small uh, Ottoman town, which was monumentalized uh, in the earlier 20th century under um, Italian influence and then uh, under direct Italian rule in World War II. So this is an Italian sketch for the new southerly square in, in the city of Tirana, which, which was to feature new administrative and uh, academic and also athletic buildings uh, in this part of the city. And this is the modern aspect uh, of the eastern side of exactly the same square. So the Institute of Archaeology is housed in this fine um, marble colonnaded uh, building, uh, which is now overshadowed by the new uh, National Soccer Stadium in the national colors red and black um, beyond it. In Albania, archaeology has been and is still rather centralized. So all projects are directly conducted by or under the supervision uh, of the Institute. Um, all finds ultimately come to the Institute. There are just two or three regional museums uh, where objects seem to stay more permanently. I, I, I believe there's one in Butrint in the south and then there's Apollonia and, and Duras in the center. So this is where objects stay, but otherwise they come to Tirana. Uh, the Institute of Archaeology in Tirana had a, a, also a long tradition for medieval archaeology, as, as did other national archaeological institutes in many other Balkan countries during communist times. And this was related to two considerations. Uh, so first, the establishment of the 
um, early histories of the respective nations and peoples. So you have Romanians, Bulgarians, um, Albanians, uh, etc. And second, you have the inquiry into everyday life and its labor conditions, which are obvious uh, preoccupations. And for, for these reasons, uh, the Institute of Archaeology in Tirana is a very relevant uh, institution for uh, medieval numismatics. And the, and the building that you, you see um, here um, houses a, a numismatic cabinet on the first floor which contains um, excavation coins. It has hoards, which were found during excavations and otherwise. It has, it has police confiscations. It has also collections of other older institutions that have been incorporated. For example, um, old monasteries that were dissolved in the immediate post-war period. And uh, post-antique um, coinage in Albania has been given some sporadic uh, uh, coverage over the last few decades. So for, um, for example, Hena Spaiu provided an overview of Byzantine coinage uh, found throughout the country, uh, mostly during excavations. And more recently, Pagon uh, Papadopoulou studied an interesting hoard which was excavated in a church in Duras. And these were copper uh, tetatira in the name of uh, Emperor Alexius I Komnenos, which were certainly local counterfeits. They, they were uh, possibly from the 13th century or maybe from the 12th century, it's not quite certain. And for, for many years now, Spresa Gyongetsai, um, who you see here on the left, has been in charge of the numismatic collection uh, of the Institute of Archaeology. And her main remit is to process uh, new excavation finds, uh, which are basically huge masses of Hellenistic and especially Roman petty cash. From the, the point of view of hordes, um, it is interesting that there are relatively few Roman hordes in the Institute, but rather a large quantity of hordes of the classical and Hellenistic periods. And these have been published uh, by her uh, quite recently uh, with the French school in Athens. So this is the publication here on the left. Um, her colleague and uh, successor at the Institute of Archaeology is Albana Meta, who received her doctorate from Paris and who published a coin corpus for the Greek city of Dirachion, um, also with the French school in Athens. And it was together with Spreza and Albana that I first discussed the possibility of looking uh, at post-antique hordes in the Institute's collection. And they have now very generously uh, proposed to me that we publish um, a full corpus of such hordes. And I, I'm very grateful to them uh, for all that they have done for me and, and towards the project. So the, the idea had been to cover the entire modern Albanian territory in all Byzantine and post-Byzantine phases. But um, as it turned out upon inspection, that the hordes in the Institute were, were heavily skewered uh, geographically and also chronologically. So leaving aside the, uh, the early Byzantine period, one, one might have imagined hordes from the period around the year 1000 or the year 1100, when, when the empire uh, under Basil II and Emperor Alex Alexius I made huge efforts to secure these uh, territories, which were very... Uh, important from a strategic point of view. Uh, however, as it turned out, no, no hoard was present um, in the Institute's collection between the 6th century AD and the period around uh, 1200. And then there were, um, again, in the Institute, about 15 or perhaps even more hoards uh, for the 13th and the 14th centuries. And uh, so th these medieval hoards are mostly from the area between Duras and flora, and also um, from the extreme south, uh, so from the Ionian Sea um, along the Greek border. And I think the reason for this um, may be uh, the um, extreme instances of warfare in, in, the, in the medieval period, and also the expansionist policies of many states that uh, infringed on this general area. Then, of course, you have the commercial revolution and also the, the demographic revolution and, and the, ri the rise of Venetian trade. So today I will look at uh, two of these hordes um, from the south, and I will give some precise 
interpretations. But f first of all, I'm going to say a few words about the political uh, situation. So th this map here shows the situation a century after the Fourth Crusade. So it's the, it's the situation in 1300. Um, so there are important Latin states in the south. You have Achaia and Athens, which were the product of, of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. Then in, in pink, uh, we have Byzantium, which is, a, which is now new and dynamic under the Paleologan uh, dynasty. And it has reestablished itself in the Balkans. Uh, it has gone westwards from Constantinople. In green, uh, you have an important uh, independent Greek state, which existed in Epiros, uh, which also goes back to the Fourth Crusade. And then on the coastline, uh, near Corfu and around Douras, uh, we have possessions of the Angevins of Naples, um, which are the result of alliances with Epiros. And then in the very north, and very importantly in the future, you will have the Kingdom of Serbia, uh, which was expanding and which was by now an Adriatic power. Uh, a bit later, uh, so th this is a double map, basically, uh, which shows the situation in 1340 and then in 1350. So the, the, the thick black line that you see across here indicates the westward expansion of the Byzantine Empire in the 1330s. So it now reaches the Adriatic and the Ionian, and it has terminated the existence of independent Epiros. Then you have some diagonal lines on the left, which shows the subsequent uh, situation. So um, uh, in the 1350s, which is basically the southward expansion of the Serbian empire, uh, which then removes Byzantium from all of these territories, from Epiros, from Thessaly. And this occurred in the, uh, from the middle to the late 1340s. And in line with this, the, um, two of the main protagonists of today's story are uh, Emperor Andronicus III, so he was active in, in the West. He was the Byzantine emperor, act, um, very much active in Epiros. And then on the right, you have the Serbian um, Stefan Dushan. He, he was king, but he crowned himself emperor. And he led the southward expansion of uh, this same state. Uh, just to give you an, a flavor of the important towns of the area, you have, for example, the inland town of Ioannina in Epiros. And this was first independent Epirot, then it became Byzantine, and then it became Serbian. So all, all of these places changed hands in line with the political changes. Same goes for Avlon, uh, which we saw, uh, which is um, modern flora. And this has a castle called Ka Kanina, which, which rises above the city. And, uh, and likewise, this was Epirot and then became Byzantine. And then from the early 1340s, it was Serbian. And in, in these transitions, towns such as uh, Janina and Avlon and their rulers received important privileges. So a famous golden bull uh, from a Byzantine emperor for the Bishop of Kanina, which is published, you can see the publication on the left, it is now preserved in New York City. Um, the immediate area of interest to us are um, basically the inland territories lying in front of uh, the island of Corfu. And this, this area was in medieval times called Vagenetia. Um, it's a rather confined area along the coast. Uh, so on the image, we see the island of Corfu uh, on the left uh, with its capital Corfu town. And then to the northeast across the strait is the lo uh, location of Utrint, which sits on the south end um, of an inland lake, which is called Lake Butrint, the, the, the dark area. And then to the north of the lake, we find a plain, uh, which ends in a steep ridge. And this is the location of another important town, uh, another ancient town called Finiki. So just to show you what this looks like, so uh, Corfu is now known as an important Venetian town, you know, great palaces, churches, but so we should not forget that in this period, it was Angevin or Neapolitan, and it was rather small. It was confined to this rock here, which is now called, called the Old Fortress. And then moving across the straits, um, uh, Corfu formed a, a double colony with Butrint, which is again a type of uh, Acropolis, uh, which lies between the Ionian Sea, which is to the left of your image, and, and the lake, which is... Uh, 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 towards the top and the right. 
And then finally, Finiki, which I mentioned, uh, is located on the top of this mountain. So, uh, uh, so Finiki was already part of this territory which changed hands frequently. So, Epirot, Byzantium, and so forth. In the early 2000s, Stender uh, Muchai the, uh, of the Institute of Archaeology um, excavated a couple of churches in the immediate area. So there's Shen Yan, which, um, which is basically means St. John, which is in the extreme left of this image. There's a very small hamlet uh, on the very left. And then just beyond, about one kilometer out of the image uh, to the northwest, is a, a church in the village of Nivica. So the, the specific numismatic material from these two churches will be dealt with um, in a forthcoming contribution uh, to Archaeologia Medievale. Uh, so this will be myself and uh, Skender Mujai and also uh, his assistant Swella Shiheri. And uh, again, I must thank them for this collaboration. Uh, so the, the two churches excavated by Skenda Mujai, uh, which we call Shen Yan and Nivica, have much in common. So they're extremely small three aisle churches uh, with a narthex. They face east. They both date to the Middle Byzantine period and, uh, and both came to the end of their usage in the 14th century. And both contained also a stratum of ash and they contained a, a coin hoard each. So they're, they're similar in many respects. And finally, both churches would have been placed in the middle of what we may imagine to have been the open countryside, so that they were not in any uh, habitable area. It was uh, it was open countryside, as far as we can tell. And this is quite a common thing in rural Byzantium, in rural late Byzantium. So um, Nivica produced the earlier numismatic evidence of the two churches. So in, in the northwestern corner of the central aisle, there's a little dot, which you can see maybe, um, a, a hoard of 154 coins was found in a ceramic vessel. Uh, and th this vessel had been lowered to the floor and the, the position proves an apparent uh, destruction, um, which is attested by a burnt layer. And all 154 coins um, of this uh, hoard belong to one denomination, which is the Dinier Tournois, uh, which is a, a billion a penny style coinage. So in the course of the 13th century, th this denomination became one of the main denominations minted in France. Um, it was a royal coinage in France, and it, um, it was minted in the names of French kings. So this is one such coin in, in the name of uh, King uh, Louis the Ninth from the second half of the 13th century. It features on the obverse a cross, and on the reverse it has a, a temple or, or castle. But the coins in the uh, Nivica hoard were, were not French, but they were of uh, southern Balkan mintage. And uh, this map uh, shows a selection of some of the main and rarer mints which produced uh, the same denomination, the Dinier Tournois, in the later 13th and then in the earlier 14th century. And uh, from these mints, the, the three main mints are Clarenza and the Peloponnese, then Thebes in the eastern mainland, and Nafpaktos on the mainland. And the distribution of these mints uh, ties in with the uh, contemporary political structures, which I've mentioned earlier. So you have one mint basically in Achaia, one in, Ath in the Duchy of Athens, one in Thessaly, one in Epiros, uh, one in uh, Andrevin Corfu, and so forth. And from the town, from the time of the uh, Fourth Crusade onwards, the, the town of Arta, which which lies to the north of the Ambracian Gulf, so in, in southern Epiros, uh, this town was the main uh, residence of the local rulers of Epiros, who were from the Angelos uh, Ducas uh, dynasty. And, uh, and these rulers were usually antagonistic uh, uh, to the main Byzantine emperors in Constantinople, although they, they were given the title of, of despot by, uh, by these emperors, so that they were local rulers. And the, the so-called despotate, I mean, this is not quite a correct word, uh, underwent uh, important dynastic changes in the 14th century. So in 1318, despot Thomas was, was assassinated 
by Nicholas Orsini, who was the count of the nearby island of Kefalonia. So you can see the, these territories in the very light green color on the left. And so he took charge of, of this large mainland state, uh, Nicholas Orsini, and he ruled it from Arta post-1318. The, the Italian Orsini family had actually held these island, these Western islands since even before the Fourth Crusade. In uh, 1323, it was again Nicholas's turn uh, to be assassinated at Arta, uh, th this time by his own brother, uh, John Orsini. So um, Arta and uh, Dinitournois were approximately minted from, from this moment onwards. So they are in the name of this new ruler, John II Orsini, and these issues uh, dominate the Nibitsa horde almost completely. So that there are only three contemporary coins of Clarenza in the Nibitsa horde. There are 145 of Arta, and there are none from any of the other hordes, so no Theban or Nafpaktos issues, and this, this is most unusual. So um, these... Um, Art and Tournois of John, um, they have, I've given the uh, legend here, so they read IOHS Despotus, so he claimed to be despot, which he was only later on, um, and then on the reverse, De Arta Castro, uh, so at the uh, castle or town of uh, Arta, and they have been studied uh, sporadically for some 150 years, um, first in the work of, of Pavlos uh, Lambros, which you see here, uh, Pavlos Lambros being a prolific writer on medieval Greek coins. So he, he published this monograph on unpublished coins of the medieval uh, rulers in Greece. So uh, Lambros discerned styles of lettering for um, Arta and also marks around the reverse castle. So there are different marks you can see here, an upright and an annulet. A B and an E in, in the field, uh, some dots and a star. And um, if you look at number 18, this has a, a rather sort of strange head uh, to the right of the castle, which uh, looks a bit like a, a, a baseball cap. And I, I will show you an image of this later. So the, the information provided by Lambros back then uh, was not followed up for, for many years. So for, only from the 1960s onwards, some uh, Bulgarian scholars noted Dini Tournois uh, of, of Arta in Bulgarian contexts. And then in the 1990s, uh, Anastasios Zamalis um, made a, a, a half-hearted attempt at some kind of typology. So in, in my recent book, I try to improve on this state of affairs. I, I looked for particularly important hordes which contain uh, art and uh, tournois. And I try to source uh, also specimens from other collections, from the big and important um, international collections. So I built up a typology, uh, which again is based around style of lettering and symbols in the field. This is just to give you an impression of what is what the typology looks like. Uh, and also the quality of execution and of metal. And I, I borrowed the classification system uh, from Zamalis. So I have three main groups. Uh, they're entitled IO Alpha, IO Beta, and IO Gamma. And these are chronologically progressive uh, within the reign of John II Orsini. And there's also a deterioration down to IO Gamma. So towards the end of Gamma, the, the legends become nonsensical, um, basically. And uh, also Gamma is, is in a sense a group apart. This is this is the group that dominates completely in Bulgaria and in other parts of the southern Balkans. And um, also in Epiros itself, there are some hordes, some rare hordes, which contain exclusively IO Gamma coins, so these inferior coins. And in, in Epiros, they may be called reject hordes. So uh, it, it is a currency which has been set aside because it is substandard and not useful. This would be the interpretation. And in the Bulgarian context, these IO gamma coins uh, would have fulfilled the function of, of copper coinage, I, I would argue, since uh, supplies had dried up. There were no more Byzantine supplies. There was no indigenous uh, Bulgarian copper. So that they had an important uh, different function uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the Balkans. 
So I'm just going to show you some coins uh, with these types to give you a, a quick impression. So this is an IO Alpha variety one. So it's it's an early good type, uh, broad open letters. And then on the reverse next to the castle, you have an upright and an O. Uh, then you have uh, IO Alpha variety two. It's the same overall style, but uh, this has this small head on the reverse that I mentioned uh, with this funny little head and what might look like a baseball cap. So after IO Alpha, we move to IO be Beta, which, which is quite different. Um, the, the lettering is now small and uh, Gothic, and especially the letter S, uh, you see three S's on the obverse. Uh, it's sort of curled up and uh, looks like an like an eight and there's a small b on in the reverse field and uh the, the metal here still looks to me low grade billon so uh, 10 percent uh, silver or uh, thereabouts and then we move on to the gamma group iog gamma and so this group uh, uh looks like it is entirely made of a copper alloy uh, rather than being a billon coin it has also small gothic writing but IO uh, Gamma has various degrees of inadequacies in style and legend. Uh, for example, here um, on the obverse, there's no initial cross at the top. And also the legend uh, IOHS Desportus is not simply not quite there. There, there, are, um, uh, there are inadequacies also there. And this is a very relatively common grouping. Uh, so it's, it can be found in Epirot hordes and also Bulgarian hordes. And um, there's a horde which was found near Nafpaktos in, in, um, on the Greek mainland in the 1970s, and uh, this was then dispersed. Uh, so the collectors, uh, Zamalis of Athens and Leo Stamas of London and Henri Potier of Brussels had um, uh, them... Uh, had Dignitonois of Nafpaktos in their collections, and they can now be found in, in Princeton and in Brussels, in, in the Princeton and Brussels cabinet, for example. So th this is a Princeton coin, for, uh, arguably from Nafpaktos, and uh, this is another Princeton coin, again, arguably from Nafpaktos. And again, you can see um, that style, metal, and, and legends are uh, substandard. So finally, we will turn to the Nivitsa hoard, which is our subject today, and which contained 154 Dini Tournois. All but nine are from the Arta Mint. So the first important thing to point out here is that in, in, pre in preparation for my book, which I mentioned, I, I consulted um, art and coins at, you know, in different places, Princeton, Brussels, ANS, Paris, Oxford, London, at, you know, uh, Venice, in the Athens Numismatic Collection, in the local efforts in Yanina and Corfu and you know other places, but I, I managed to amass um, merely one hundred specimens in in doing so. And here in southern Albania, in in one single hoard, um, we have now fifty percent more uh, art and coins than I was able to source uh, worldwide. So this is obviously an important point. And uh, second, in the light of uh, the other halls, um, one might have expected a, a new um, Artan uh, dominated hoard from Epiros to contain mostly IO gamma specimens like Nafpaktos, for example, but this is, this is absolutely not the case. Uh, it's quite different. So uh, we find here in Nivitsa from top to bottom, three coins of Achaia. So they're very, re they're quite recent coins of of the of Clarenza uh, um, of Robert of Taranto, who was Prince of Achaia, and then we find the Artan coins, um, so different IO Alpha varieties, uh, and then a, a, also a good quantity of IO Beta coins, and then merely a, a very low percentage of IO Gamma varieties at the end, and uh, finally there are contemporary counterfeits, and again they are all counterfeits of Artan coins. Uh, as their prototypes, which is again quite unusual and, and bears um, uh, uh, bearing in mind. So in, in my book, I argued that IO Gamma was, was launched by John Orsini 
uh, in the period. So you, you can see the dates of um, John Orsini at the top, 1323 to 1336 or 37, um, when he was assassinated. They, they all get assassinated uh, in this period. So I, I argue in my book that in, in circa 1331, um, IO Gamma was launched in, in line with an aggressive expansionist uh, policy of John towards Thessaly, so towards territories in the east. And in line with this, the, the Nivitsa hoard uh, might be dated on the basis of the Artan coins uh, to the uh, sort of early 1330s. This cannot be entirely squ uh, squared with the Akai coins at the with dates slightly less. so that there's a numismatic dating here of the 13 of the mid 1330s. So I'm going to show you a few coins from the hoard. Uh, so this, this is one of the three Achaean coins that I have mentioned. So this is in the name of Robert. Uh, so Robert's P. Ak, Aki, so uh, Prince of Achaia on the obverse, Clarentia on the reverse, so uh, city of Clarenta. This is an um, art and IO alpha variety from Nizza. So this has a lunette uh, under the castle on the reverse, and it has triple dots. Uh, another IO alpha variety from the Nivitsa horde. It has a small fleur-de-lis next to the castle uh, on the reverse again. And then uh, we move into um, IO beta. So th this is the different style, but still a Billen coin, as I uh, said, and then we move from beta to gamma. So this is has all sorts of in, inadequacies of of metal and style and lettering. So the the, the legends again are not are simply not quite there. And then finally, we have these uh, counterfeits. So that these are outright counterfeits. Uh, um, again, in the name of John. Uh, Orsini, so you have the De Arta Castro, but the, the style is completely different, and uh, so that they are quite obviously counterfeits. So it became obvious to me that, that Nivitsa uh, was a rare opportunity and uh, that the coins required a uh, die study in order to establish a uh, structure and sequence of minting. So all these different IO varieties re required a bit of uh, sorting out. And also to look into some quantification, uh, if at all possible. So I'm giving you here um, a few examples of die identities. So th this is one reverse die on two coins, 17 and 18. This is an IO alpha variety two with the um, with the three dots. So one die identity, another pair. For the for an ob this is an obverse again IO alpha, uh, so again two coins may, uh, arguably struck from the same uh, die. Um, it should be said, however, that the results of the die study, so the, the, the summarized at the bottom, were rather mixed. So I found um, very few die identities in the totality of the hoard, and I basically found no identities across. Of any of the many varieties and sub varieties. So I O A var one, two, three, absolutely no, no links to allow me to bring them into some sort of order. So if we look at um, the the total numbers for I O alpha and I O beta, so the, um, these coins represent about, uh, these varieties represent about eight years of minting. Uh, 1323 to 1331, or um, maybe even less, you know, if we assume that he started minting late. Uh, so I, I observed, so I had a sample of 132 coins, and I observed 128 obverse dies and 124 reverse dies, so virtually no uh, duplication. So th this demonstrates, first of all, uh, that reverse dies, um, which are fewer, uh, and they're the dies that feature the castle, uh, I, I, one might argue that they were technically speaking the obverse dies, so that they were probably the dies sitting in the anvil because they are fewer. 
And then second, the, the ratio of sample size with, with die numbers is so close that, that none of the existing formulas would have any meaning. So the, the only thing we can surmise from this is, is that the total number of original dyes, so not dyes observed, but dyes actually in existence per annum would have, would have been extremely high. But uh, we, we currently don't know how high. That we have no statistical methods, that one might say, to establish that. So the, the curious that the, the, there are there's more than one curious observation to be made for Nivitsa. So they, they need to be put into some form of context. Uh, so it, um, in about 1320, uh, which is roughly 15 years before. Nivica, um, a hoard was deposited in another place uh, nearby, uh, which is called Shen Dimitri or, or Saint, Saint Demetrius. It's a location very close to Butrint. It's about 20 kilometers uh, south of uh, Nivica. And uh, toward contained a, a very typical selection of coins of Achaia uh, on the left. Uh, I don't know the, the precise quantities because it hasn't been published yet but they, they appear to be just regular um and then athens so the thebes mint which was minting for athens and then the nafpaptos mint so th this looks like any other hoard of greece if you like um and then in pretty much the same year which is uh, 1320 again uh, 15 years before nivica a hoard was deposited in or near Ioannina. And it, it held, again, a very similar ratio uh, of the, the main Dinitournois issues of Greece. Um, so Achaia, Athens, and so forth. In uh, 1318, uh, um, the city of Yanina became Byzantine, as I've said. And it, it was issued with a golden bull on, on that occasion by uh, Emperor Andronicus II. In, uh, in this document, in this crystal ball, Yanina is allowed to use its own currency. This is a very important point. And I, I would argue this is a recognition um, of the fact that this, this northerly part of Epiros had already transitioned to the tournoi uh, currency as, as its main currency uh, in the um, early 14th century at the very latest. And um, the striking of Digne Tournois at Corfu, which, which occurred just before 1300 uh, under the Angevins, is another uh, proof in this matter, so the, the, the prevalence of, of Tournois in this area. So this coin here is, is in the name of Philip, uh, so Prince Philip of Taranto, who, who was the father of Robert of Taranto, we saw uh, just a few coins ago, and he was Lord of Corfu. So on, on the obverse, we read in abbreviation Philippus de Gratia, and on the reverse, uh, Corfol Dominus. So in, in a regular and uh, logical manner, um, the new issues of Arta, which were then minted from 1323 onwards, would, would add themselves to this existing uh, stock of uh, tournoi currency. So a hoard, uh, th this hoard here, uh, from the ancient, from near the ancient sanctuary of Dodona, so this is called R Romanos Dodonis, uh, shows us uh, how this might have occurred. So um, on the very right, you have a single IO alpha variety of Arta, and this is to be found amongst many more issues of Achaia, Athens, and so forth. So it's an another regular hoard to which uh, Artan coins um, are added, but th um, this was quite different at Nivica. So I, I've devised uh, this little diagram um, for the formation of Nivica, for the unusual formation of Nivica. So on the left and right, you have the, you have timelines. Uh, so you have the parallel mints of Arta and Clarenza, left and right. They were issuing coins in the years of formation of the hoard, so in, in the 1320s. And in the center, you have those coins that actually uh, made it into the hoard eventually from this, from this, uh, from these coins that were struck. So for about eight years, as I've said, so 1323 to 1331, many dyes were used at Arta per annum for IO alpha and IO beta, many, but we don't know how many. And um, the coins that were made from some of these dyes 
not, not all of them, but some of them, a sample were included at Nivitsa. So you can see the movement from the dice to the hoard. At Clarence on the right, uh, a vastly higher number of dyes was developed per was deployed per annum. So we, we haven't done a dye study, but it was a much more prolific mint. So we, we have to imagine many, many more dyes being uh, used and many coins, many more coins being made from these dyes. But but in fact, none of these coins made it. Um, uh, into the Nivitsa hoard at all, even if the territory has, had long been established as one receiving and using Clarence and Tournoir. It is as if a kind of firewall uh, existed in, these, uh, in this decade. Um, the only exception is at the later end of the formation process of the hoard. So the Artem supplies fizzle out under Io Gamma, in the early 1330s, and then you have three coins of Robert of Taranto from Clarenza that uh, make it through this uh, supposed firewall. So that there are two related questions. Um, so in, in what exceptional circumstances did the area receive a steady stream of uh, successive issues all from one mint, i.e. the Arta mint, uh, over eight years? And how does one explain that the other issues which were better and larger and more prolific were so consistently excluded. So um, my explanation for this is uh, uh, geopolitical. So the, the, the rule of Epiros, uh, John II Orsini was, was coming up under increasing uh, pressure in, in, in this area of ours. In 1330 or maybe 1331, the, the Angevins of Corfu uh, managed to assert themselves in Boutrint and its area. In 1328, so just before that, Andronicus III became sole emperor, and he also pursued an aggressive policy in the extreme west. And um, it, is, it is likely that um, the area of Finiki that we see here was was the most northerly part of the territory that was ruled by John, but that um, it was it was this area um, that was ever more encroached on by by the Andrevins coming from the west and the Byzantines uh, coming from the east. So, in in line with the important information which we received from the historian uh, John Cantacuzinos in the early 1330s. The, the Albanian population of these areas, that they, they were transhumant uh, and they were in open revolt in the early 1330s. And, and um, this revolt was caused by the, the heavy hand of the imperial Byzantine presence. So we have a revolt, the most recent one was in 1336. And then in 1337, Andronicus's troops uh, met this uh, um, resistance, um, according to the writings of Cantacuzinos, uh, with extreme violence. I mean, th this is all written in, in his history. And uh, they gained also huge numbers of livestock from these Albanians. And it, it is quite likely that this happened in, in our very area, in this coastal um, area that we're talking about. And then in 1338, the, the region of Finiki is demonstrably Byzantine. So um, accordingly, I think, you know, it, it is, of course, impossible to identify the, the final owner of the Nivitsa hoard. Uh, but this person would, would very probably have sought out the church uh, to deposit the hoard in these uncertain times. Or, or, he, or he or she may even have sought refuge there personally during the violent uh, imperial onslaught, which, which happened in 1337. Uh, before that, uh, so for the decade before that or more, there had been consistent consignments of art and coins uh, to the territory, which were arguably part of the, the attempts um, of the Orsini administration to, to rule the area, to stabilize it. Uh, but the area was, uh, again, arguably um, uh, so compromised by this stage that, that regular coin circulation, which we, we'd seen in previous uh, decades, had, had possibly ceased, uh, hence the almost total absence of Achaean coins in the hoard. So it's, it's a very skewered hoard for, for these very uh, special reasons. 
So I'm, I'm going to summarize the next horde uh, in four or five minutes. Um, this is the Shenyan horde that I mentioned. Uh, so from the foot of the Finiki Acropolis, uh, very close to Nisa. Uh, again, it was found in a church. Uh, it's a much smaller horde. Uh, only 12 coins were contained in the hoard. So what we have are three Denitonois at the top, and then you have nine uh, Venetian soldini. So this is a, a fine silver coin. It's not a bill coin, but uh, rather small. Uh, so we have the breakdown of issues here. And it, the, the soldini uh, at the very bottom uh, take us into the early 1340s. So it's, we're looking at a few years beyond Nivica beyond 1337 of Nivica. So the, the Venetian Soldino was a recent innovation. And uh, if you read the work of Alan Stahl, it, 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 the nature of this new denomination is very well explained in, in his work. It's basically a, a way of unifying the various Venetian systems of account, but uh, overall cheapening these systems because of the ensuing bullion uh, crisis in the 14th century. So that this was a new currency that was preferred by Venetian colonial administrations and also by traders. So in, in Greece, um, the quickest impact was commercial of, of, this, so of this new denomination, um, more commercial rather than administrative. So you have early Soldino hordes from the 1330s, early 1340s, so the same period as Shen Yan, uh, in the in the routes going into the Gulf of Corinth and then around the eastern mainland, so the the the, the new Shenyan horde becomes part of this rather small group of of early hordes, and the arrival of these coins in Finique falls into the into the, this short window of imperial Byzantine de denomination, which lasted no more than a decade. So it lasted from 1337 or 1338, as we've just seen, to 1347, uh, when the Serbian invasion took place. And it, it may be argued uh, that uh, stable conditions were re-established by this new uh, Byzantine administration. So traders could source uh, the produce of the area. The, the area was known for some produce, um, uh, salt and fish from the lake of Butrint, and also it was known for animal products. Um, and of course, we've seen, we've just seen uh, all these livestock that were mentioned by Cantacuzinos. And th these products are attested in a nearby Corfu, which was the main international hub and an outlet uh, for our area. In terms of the chronology, so um, it would appear that the towns of Yanina and, and Avlon or Vlora, um, which we've seen, had become Serbian in the 1340s, in the, in the very early 1340s. But the, the mainland areas uh, opposite Corfu uh, probably became Serbian a few years later in 1347, so that it, it was a, a last sort of surge towards the west. And in the past, um, I published a, a coin in relation to this uh, conquest. Um, this is a, a very rare Western Bulgarian coin found in, on the Greek side in uh, what is called Thesprotia. And I, I, I brought this very rare coin, which can be dated um, quite well uh, in, in connection with the conquest itself. And, and uh, this seems to support also a dating of about 1347. So I, I would go with 1347 uh, for the um, deposition of the Shenyan horde. Uh, so Shenyan uh, is similar to Nivitsa uh, in the sense that uh, intense violence called hoarding, uh, uh, um, in, in this case, uh, Serbian violence, and it's caused uh, possibly refuge. Um, within the apparent security of a church. Uh, we shouldn't forget that these were uh, the, uh, possibly the only well-built structures in the entire area. But in, in both cases, uh, this course of action was to no avail. And, and the hordes were, of course, not uh, recovered by their owners, but by a 21st century archaeologist. 
archaeologists. Um, so in um, closing, I, I thank you for your attention. And uh, we hope, so um, my colleagues and I, uh, to be able to report more um, interesting medieval material from Albania and from the Institute of Archaeology in Tirana, where, where these two hordes are now housed uh, shortly. So th thank you very much. Julian, thank you. That, that was uh, really quite fascinating. Um, I, I know that you need to leave at the top of the hour, so we do have a, a few minutes anyway I mean, for uh, some questions, if, if there are any questions. I have a question. Sure, Mike, go ahead. Uh, 1346 uh, stands out as the uh, year of the bubonic plague outbreak. Is it possible that that could have been related to the circumstances of the horde? Yes, I mean, you're quite right, and they, they happen at exactly the same time, but there, there is a destruction layer in the church, uh, that's the only, but of course people um, uh, would have hoarded a lot, um, you know, people always hoarded a lot, you know, in any time, but then the hoarders themselves might have perished uh, in in that plague so you know whether they perished uh, or you know if we surmise that the owner of shenyan uh, had not lived uh, you know to see the, the uh, to to see him return to his hoard, him or her uh, to, uh, to, to return to the horde um we we we, we cannot know what, you know from what from what causes exactly they uh, uh, they weren't around, but you're quite right. I mean, huge numbers of the uh, of the contemporary population would not have made it beyond that date, um, and there are certainly patterns of hoarding uh, all over Europe uh, uh, relating to this. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Here, I, I do see that we uh, have a question in the chat from uh, Daniel Wolf. He's asking what. Do, uh, what did they do for precious metal money to supplement the low-grade billing? Yes, I mean that's a, that, that's another good question. I mean we we have no hordes, and um, uh, um, there 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 would have been a bit of uh, Venetian gold uh, available. That there, there is a hoard from uh, from near the Ambracian Gulf. Uh, which has exactly the same dating, um, mid 1340s. So again, we have exactly the same question: Is it a a black uh, a death horde, if you like, or or a Serbian conquest horde? The, the, these ducats are very rare, and uh, we, we we have to surmise that uh, that certain payments could be comfortably made with these billion coins. And so they, they, they did fit in with the local uh, system of account, which was the, the gold hyperperion, you know, of, of old Byzantine times. But uh, we have enough evidence in the uh, written sources to suggest that these hyperpira were am amalgams of billion coins. Mm. But of course, they, they had to be good billion coins. So that, that's why some of the art and coins were not interesting and had to be sort of weeded out and hoarded separately and so forth. But uh, so it, yeah, in in some, you know, very rare gold and mostly billion is, uh, and then eventually um, uh, Venetian silver in the form of these soldini that they 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 would would dominate almost completely by the second half of the 14th century. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, I, I do have a question myself. Um, you said at one point that um, these two hordes uh, seem to have been associated with people seeking refuge, you know, during times of crisis, invasion, and so forth. Um, and uh, as as a result of that, um, they they were not able to retrieve the uh, the coins that um, that these people sought refuge, you know, in the apparent safety, as you said, of the church you know itself um you know which uh, you know it's fascinating in and of itself why would they they think a church would be a, a safe, safe refuge place i mean we, we certainly know from antiquity that uh, people would seek refuge within a temple precinct which presumably would be an inviolate area um you know during these these sort of uh, invasions and crises and so forth um the other 
the question that I have though is whether or not any hordes uh, found in churches could be associated with donations of, of one sort or another, because some of the interpretation of hordes that have been associated with ancient Greek temples, for example, have been interpreted as donations rather than um, you know deposits associated with crises and so forth. So yeah. are are there any church hordes um, from this period that you think could be associated with donations rather than sort of crises? Yes, I mean, the, the, you're you're right to say that there are many hordes, uh, you know, in Greece and Italy and so forth that that have been found um, within churches, and they they are <clears throat> they are hordes of different kinds, if you like. You know, some are in graves, some are in cult areas, so they're they're sort of pilgrimage mementos. So they're, they're they're not necessarily hordes in the, in the strictest sense uh th there are no foundation th there are no foundation hordes as such uh which are i guess are known for the ancient world mm -hmm. but the, the the idea of a donation so a um a pot of money that belongs to the church rather than an an individual f uh, frequenting the church uh, I, to to my knowledge that has not been proposed in in the literature but of course, it's a uh, it's a very interesting point because uh, of course these churches had a had a budget and uh, you know had had running costs, uh, what have you, and a basket that's passed around, you know, at every con you know, every meeting. So yeah, yeah, but you know they had they, they had a budget beyond that. I mean, they 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 received important donations in land and so forth. They, they were economic centers in their own right. Right uh and uh you know that th there are so-called um monastic th there are monastic documents uh which we know as tipica and other types of documents which are, which are inventories or they tell us how things are to be handled but these are usually quite large large sums of money so you know uh t 12 pence there or 150 here right. i don't know it's, it's it's difficult but of course the the, the most difficult thing at the end is that we we cannot we cannot know for sure you know the the position within the church the the you know it, it doesn't give it away uh, in in either direction so it's um right. i think it's it's early days yet to come up with a definitive answer but um, yeah as, so, as as is usual with the interpretation <laughs> the of right so Julian, I'd, I'd like to thank you again. That, that was really a wonderful presentation. Um, Peter, Peter, have we time for one more question? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Robert, okay. go ahead. Um, for those of us uh, like me, almost completely ignorant of this coinage, uh, what happened in the following 50 years? Did all the Venetian coinage take over or, or, or what happened? Yes. And in fact, most of the feudal Greece disintegrated. Uh, the the Andrevin uh, Kingdom of Naples became more or less disinterested, and uh, and Venetian interests prevailed. They, they, they were they were both commercial and strategic. So that they 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 had a very acute. The, the Venetians had a very acute sense that certain positions had to be held to stem back uh, a Turkish expansion or also Byzantine expansion, which was you know in, in the in the 14th century Byzantium was still expanding in certain areas so the the whole nature of feudal Greece changed uh, so instead of being you know local and uh, under a, a Neapolitan um, uh, lordship it became Venetian and and the Venetians had a different philosophy of money if you like they they produced everything uh, domestically in in Venice and they they shipped it out. So you, you have successive Venetian issues. You have Soldini, and then you have a, a more overt colonial coinage in the second half of the 14th century, which is the Tornicello. So yeah, you're, you're right. It became mostly Venetian. It, it became you know um, half Byzantine, half Venetian, and then ultimately Ottoman. Of course, uh, that's the that's the main uh, sort of trajectory, if you like. Thank you. Wonderful. Again, uh, Julian, just would like to thank you very much for your time today. This has really been wonderful. Well, thank you very much for, for hosting me and, and, and for, for all of you who, uh, who, who took part in today's presentation. Thank you.